Right, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, everyone who's taken part, either up here or as part of the audience. Um, that we've had a good practical day. I hope you'll take back thoughts, lessons, ideas and challenges and let's get moving. As I mentioned earlier on, and you'll have seen it, a lot of you will have distributed copies, we got a leaflet called Broken Britain. Uh, and it's not just a leaflet, it actually explains, sums up in two words, the state of our country. And it's not just Britain that's broken, specifically British politics is broken. And when you find problems getting people to come to meetings and so on, it's a symptom of a much wider problem. It's not a problem of this party. It's not us. There's a general, first of all, disillusionment with all politicians. Any of you who have knocked on doors during elections, you will know for sure, what I know for sure, that the biggest reason for someone slamming a door in your face isn't that you're British National Party. It's because you're a politician. You're all the same. You're all thieving scum. You're all beep, 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 beep. And looking at Tory, Liberal, Labour, all of them, you have to say, yeah, the British public have got a point when they say that. And when all that they hear about us is the smears and the lies of the BBC and the mass media, it's really no surprise. But as a matter of fact, we've seen it time and time again, and it's still going on because we saw it in Rotherham just a few weeks ago. Despite all that, or perhaps because of all that, there is an awareness amongst a section of the British public that actually we're different. And that is something hugely in our favour and it's something that we have to build on. So the first problem is this disillusionment with the political elite and we get some of the backwash of that. We have to strive against that. The second thing that's broken politics, politics comes out of a community. And the community, the sense of community in this country has been gutted. It's been gutted by several things. Maggie Thatcher probably started it or summed it up when she said there's no such thing as society. It's just a free-for-all for, for short-term money. And we all of us, with the exception perhaps of a few of the youngest here, we've all of us grown up in a Britain where basically you've never had it so good in material terms. We've all of us grown up with that and that's what's moulded our society now. And so on top of this materialistic, yeah, we've had it pretty good, I can get on with me, or at most my family. I needn't worry about the bigger picture. It's not for me to do. We've got an additional problem on that. And the fact that this is now a multicultural broken society. And uh, if you want to look at one sociologist, one person who really sums up what's happened in Western society, you need to look at a fellow called Putman, a professor from a New York University, and a very important book called Bowling Alone. And Putman, who's actually, he was one of the, the gurus of New Labour and so on, they all worshipped the ground he stood on. He set about looking at multicultural societies and multicultural areas. From a leftist position, he thought he was going to find lovely things. The more multicultural area, area it is, the more vibrant it is. You know all the bullshit, don't you? Heard it a thousand times. What he found shook him rotten. He found that there's a direct correlation between the more multicultural a society is and the more it falls apart. Hence the title of his main work, Bowling Alone. He did expect, he was studying the, the ghettos of North America, for starters. He expected to find that when you get a multiracial area, the communities fall apart so that it becomes them and us. And he expected to find, because he was at least an honest academic, he expected to find that in areas which have been multiculturalised, enriched, as they call it here, that <clears throat> it would make our people one block, and their people one block, and their people another block, all mutually antagonistic, but at least within ourselves, quite united. That'd be logical, wouldn't it? Them and us. What he found was that's not the case. The more multicultural it is, the more different groups there are, the more people don't just distrust the other, and when you've lived with them, you pretty soon learn that what's propaganda and what's real so you don't trust them. That's sensible, that's logical, that's explicable. But also, the worse they are, the more people distrust their own community as well. And the more multicultural a society is, the more people withdraw, not just from the multicultural society, but from everything, from everything in their community, they just withdraw within their own house and they shut the door. 
And that's what's going on on a huge scale. And I believe it's going on not just in the East Londons and the Birminghams and the Rotherhams and so on, in the bad bits. I think it's also happening to everybody, literally everybody, because everyone takes their cue off television. And even if your little village somewhere down in Dorset or up in the North Yorkshire Moors or in one of the rural patches of Cumbria in my constituency, even if your little village is completely unenriched, old like it used to be, still decent, still safe, still familiar, if you watch the television, you take in subconsciously that all the newsreaders are glamorous Asian girls with cut crystal glass English accents because mummy and daddy sent them to a very posh school, that... Um, all these different groups have their niches, don't they? And you, take, you get the message that this society is totally multicultural. So according to Professor Putman, that will mean automatically that our people withdraw more and more and more and become more and more selfish and more and more just concerned in their own affairs because that's the only way they can get through living in this utterly unnatural state that's been forcibly imposed upon us. And that is where we are, and that's what we're fighting against. And so the people who want to knock this party and say, oh, you're smaller than you were years ago, we can do far better. I'll tell you what, I haven't bloody seen them. We're the ones leading from the front. We're the ones ploughing on. We're the ones getting people back. We're the ones bringing new people into nationalism, while all the little groups of knockers and whiners sit and whinge into their beer and snipe and gripe and do nothing useful whatsoever. We're the ones still making the run, running. We're the ones doing something useful. But we're doing it against this backdrop where people basically... It's almost impossible for them to get involved because everything in their subconscious is screaming at them. I live in this crazy society. The only way I can survive in it is to withdraw into my own little box. That's what we've got to overcome. It's very difficult. And then on top of that, we've also got the problem, and you all know it, when you've got really good activists, really keen, committed people who are telling you, I simply can't afford to come out. So we've also got really serious grinding poverty. There is grinding poverty back in this country right now for an awful lot of people. So you put those things all together, the disillusionment with the political elite, the problem of living in a multicultural society and everyone withdrawing in to protect themselves psychologically, and the poverty of the banker's collapse, which ordinary people are being made to pay for, and it's pretty difficult. <clears throat> and it's going to get worse. The multiculturalism is going to get worse, but I guarantee you this. A point will come, a point I believe is not that very far away, when it gets so much worse, so much quicker, that running away and hiding and staying in your own little house becomes an impossibility. And people will stand up and fight. And what you see going in Northern Ireland, when our people, our people, the loyalists of Northern Ireland... They're standing up in defence of their flag. And perhaps if you're seeing it from a long way away, you think, why are they really so upset about a piece of cloth? But it's because of the deep symbolism of that. And it's not just that their flag's been taken away. It's that house by house, street by street, day by day, they are being ethnically cleansed from their own areas. The British people of Northern Ireland are being systematically wiped out in a form of cultural genocide. And is it so different in Birmingham? Is it so different in South London? Of course it's not. It's happening to all of us as well. And the fight of the loyalists of Northern Ireland to preserve their symbol is our fight as well. Yeah. And as the pressure against Britishness in places in East London where you've got these Muslim gangs going around picking on women because they've worn a short sleeve uh, skirt and so on, all of this, that pressure is there, and the pressure of poverty and the economic collapse, which is upon the Western world, is going to grow and grow, which is going to produce a set of circumstances in which we anticipate coming to power, very different to where we are now. If you think it's bad now, you wait and see it in a few years' time. It's going to be much, much worse. Now, the idea of nationalism coming to power through collapse is nothing new. Oswald Mosley thought it for years, John Tyndall thought it for years, they went to their graves believing and hoping it was going to come and thinking it would come in their lifetime. And it didn't. There's nothing new in that idea. What is new is the circumstances out there, whereas whereby you see it, 
the Western world, the banking system, the energy system, it is in a state of collapse right now. We're living through the collapse of a civilization. It's just that it's so up close now that all you see is the fact that you've got 23 quid a week less coming in than is going out. So that's the worry. But as a matter of fact, overall, we are living through the early stages of a collapse of an entire civilization. Once it happens, then all the rules are off. Everything changes. And we're very, very new, near to that. The other thing that I would say is new is at least what we're trying to do is that previous nationalist parties have talked and looked at a coming collapse in terms of this will give us the opportunity we will, we will need to take power. They haven't sat down and done things in practical terms to prepare for that collapse. And that's what we're trying to do, and I'm going to look at some of those things today. First of all, the first thing we have to do is simply stay in the field. And as you know, over the last couple of years, there's been an immense amount of effort thrown at this party and the key individuals in this party, at various local as well as national levels, to take us out of the field. And as you know, we are still in the field, and nobody else is. For all the others, you put them all together, they're not one-tenth the size of this party and the impact of, the, of this party and the capability of this party. If anyone is going to do it, if anyone stands a hope in hell, it's this party. Nobody else. And there are good people in some of those other grouplets. And if they have our good people, whatever our past differences, we need those people back. Because in those grouplets they are wasted and working in this party, forgiven and forgotten, then we and they together can make a bigger impact. So we need those people back. If they're going to come back and keep on whining, no we don't. But if people will come back and get on with the job of building a nationalist alternative, a party, an organisation to argue for the kids who are still being groomed on the streets while the police are still turning a blind eye. If they'll come and get involved doing that, I don't care what they said about me or what I said about them. Let's put it, to get, put it behind us and get on with the cause of saving this country and saving those kids. <laughs> Out of all the groups, the most important one by a mile was the English Defence League British Freedom Party. That was a serious, systematic, hugely funded effort by a section of the ruling elite, by this Zionist neocon clique, to dominate, to simply take over nationalism and turn it into their tool to encourage the white working class to go and fight their wars and so that when the banking collapse comes, people are looking in the wrong direction instead of the real culprits. This party, we were approached. I was approached. We were offered money from the United States. And all they wanted was two things. They only wanted us to concentrate on Islam. And I yield to no one in my criticism of Islam and grooming. I put my neck on the line. Many of you have put your neck on the line as well. But it's not the only problem. And they wanted us only to focus on that. And I only came with one other thing. They wanted us to drop our criticism of the banking system. Those were the only two things. We had to concentrate on talking about Muslims and we had to drop our criticism of the international banking system. And I refused. And we refused. That was in about 2007. And all hell break lo broke loose really from that time when systematically they tried to take this party apart. And there's the self-same people in groups... Uh, various of the so-called Tory think tank groups and so on, things like Policy Exchange, things like the Centre for Policy Studies, the self-same people who organised and ran Nothing British to devastate the BNP's electoral chances with lies in the sun and things like that, those self-same people were there right at the start conspiring to create the English Defence League, then the British Freedom Party, to take real nationalism in this country and break it on the wheel and then replace it by their puppet. And we stood up to that, we faced it down, we've exposed it, and we've broken it. Their effort is broken, and we are still here. We are nationalism, we're going to stay nationalism in this country. So, for those of our rivals who remain, I have this simple message. This party will give you no space, it'll give you no quarter, 
It will give you no deals. They're all wasting their time because we are not going away. We're not getting out of their way. We are slap bang, a huge obstacle to anyone else becoming established for nationalism in this country. And rightly, we should be because the sacrifices of so many people, faces I know in here and people out there as well, still working away. We've put so much blood and sweat and tears and heartache and misery into building this party, this cause, that I'm damned if we're going to allow some bunch of Johnny-come-latelys, crooks, cranks, weirdos, freaks or anybody else to come and take it away. The British National Party is nationalism in this country and it's going to remain the nationalist vehicle in this country and the others will simply have to get used to it and go and sit and whine in corners or if they want to do something useful, come and get involved in us because this is the only game in town and it's going to stay that way. And most of all, it's going to stay that way, not by doing them down or looking over our shoulders at them, but simply by being better. Because you look at our website, which isn't perfect, but by God, it's regular. Bang, there's always something new. There's always something fresh. It's a huge resource. Adam was talking, for instance, about the what to do if you're arrested. That's an invaluable document there. And yes, I, as Adam said, I wrote the core of it but it's based on a lot of other people's experiences and a lot of people had input into that. That's a hugely valuable tool. That alone justifies this party's existence at present because when it all hits the fan out there in ethnic terms and you can't take a society as multicultural and mixed up and screwed up as Britain and impose upon it and subject it to the kind of pressures that the bankers' crisis is inflicting on ordinary people without it exploding in everybody's face and everybody damn well knows it when it does go bang that document alone is going to keep hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young British men particularly English men primarily out of prison out of court it's going to allow them to walk free when they've been involved when their communities have stood up and fought it's going to be a hugely important document there and it's important and it's powerful and it's got the reach because of our website, which is streets ahead of anybody else's. We've got BMP TV. What a fantastic tool that is. And again, to come back to what was done with Derek and co and Marlene in Rotherham and that lady. And we've changed that lady's life. And you bet your life that the powers that be are now a lot more careful. But I think more than anything, that will have shown those who are watching that, yes, you can actually make a difference. An old lady sitting, going out in desperation and begging for help can get help. That this party can provide help and that we can actually come in with a set of technologies and the ability to deliver a message on such a scale. It's not huge compared with the BBC, but it's sufficiently large a scale that the powers that be have to sit up and take notice. It didn't happen by accident and didn't happen overnight. A huge amount of effort has gone in to giving us that capability and to building up our audience so that the capability actually goes somewhere. Nobody else has got that. We've got in Voice of Freedom a superb propaganda tool, which as several of the speakers here today have pointed out, also makes money. It's not produced as a loss leader. It's not a burden on a unit. If you go out and sell it, you can, you, there's no point saying we can't sell it to our members. It's not designed for our members. It's designed for Joe Public. It's designed not just to reiterate what Joe Public read in The Sun or could have read in the Daily Mail last week and last month and for the last 10 damn years, which is what it used to be. It's designed to show people what we, what you as individuals are doing to try to make things better. It's designed to give people that example. It's designed to give people hope. And as I said earlier on, we're in the business of selling people hope, giving them a chance to think, yep, it's not absolutely hopeless. That's why we're getting more and more people leaving us money in their wills, because they think, yes, I can fight on after I'm gone, because if there is hope, it lies at least in the British National Party. It's a huge thing that we're giving to people, that you're, every time you go out, you give someone somewhere, gets one of those leaflets, or sees you in the street, and goes home thinking, perhaps it's not all over after all. Perhaps this country will live. Perhaps there will be a future for my grandchildren. That's what we're giving people, hope. And the paper does that, and it can be used to make money. Don't say you can't afford it. The thing costs you, what's the cost of that paper, Clive, as an individual copy, on a reasonable bulk order? If you buy enough 
pence. 25 pence. Anybody, almost anyone, will give you a quid. Every third or fourth person will give you a pound extra. Every tenth person will give you a fiver for it. It's simple. You sell it, it makes money. That's why Blackpool Brunch, not even here today, because they got, well, they were behind a blizzard, but nevertheless, they've got a lot of money in their bank account because, as was said, everyone comes in, you have to buy a paper to get in through the door. And even if you subscribe to it, you buy another one, you give it to a friend. It's a powerful tool. Nobody else has got that. So there's no comparison between this party and so-called rivals. As I say, we're the only ones, the only ones seriously in the field. The third thing that's going to happen, we are going to overcome UKIP. Not immediately. First of all, we have to get it into our own heads and into the hearts of our core supporters to understand this, that UKIP is not a nationalist party. UKIP is a splinter, a high right-wing reactionary upper-class splinter from the Conservative Party. And the job of the Conservative Party, in historical terms, has been to screw the working people of Britain to the floor. That's what the Tory party was for. And because it doesn't do it very well anymore, naturally there's a splinter of those who really want to screw the British people to the floor. Their main opposition to Europe isn't Britain being ruled by abroad, because they're happy to have Britain as the 50th or 51st state of the United States of America. Their opposition to Europe is fundamentally the fact that it has, in its rules and regulations, things which make life easier for ordinary working people, working time directives and so on. Now, we wouldn't want those things made in Brussels. We do not want those things made in Brussels. We'll tear all those things up. But it should be the job of a British government to protect British working men and women from exploitation by greedy employers. That should be the job. UKIP's problem with the EU is that those rules are made to protect our people and they want to tear the rules up. Our quarrel is that the rules in many cases are right, but they're made by the wrong people. They're imposed undemocratically. They're imposed stupidly and heavy handedly so that it doesn't just protect people from really big and greedy bosses, but it stops an ordinary working chap who's built a business up employing one or two people because there's too much red tape. There's a huge difference between where we come from in our opposition to the European Union and where UKIP come from. They want, and it's in their own manifesto, they want to privatise everything, bar one. They say they wouldn't privatise the post office. I don't quite know why. I think it's because they've got it into their thick heads that uh, the reason the post office is to be privatised is to comply with an EU directive. Therefore, we've got to keep the post office. Well, fair play. But in the grand scheme of things, the post office is nothing like the National Health Service. There's a fraction of the money involved in that. The post office is nothing touching the education system in Britain. And UKIP want to privatise the whole damn lot and put it all out to tender. Because it'll make money for a small number of very, very rich people. And the idea that privatised services are more efficient, no they're not. It's a sedulously cultivated myth. It's a lie. Privatised public services are more efficient at making profits for big business. Otherwise, they wouldn't do them if they weren't going to make a profit. And that's what's going on there. And UKIP are absolutely committed to privatising everything in sight. They want to deregulate the banks completely. Let the banks loose. Haven't the banks done enough damage already? UKIP's problem with the banking system is it's regulated. They want to deregulate the whole thing. Take, unfortunately, the bastards aren't in handcuffs. They should all be in handcuffs and manacles round their legs as well. And off on their way to not a prison cell where they'd sit and just get even fatter at our expense. They need to be put out to work doing proper, decent work like cleaning public toilets. That's where the bankers need to be. And UKIP want to deregulate them to let them steal even more. Perhaps, oh, two more, two more bad things. They will occasionally claim we don't really think Britain should be involved in foreign wars. That's their propaganda line. I see how their MEPs vote in the only place where UKIP have a shred of power in the European Union. And any time there's criticism of any opponent of global Zionism, any time there's pressure to put pressure on Syria or Iran, any time there's criticism of Russia... And Russia is not the flavour of the month. 
with the international power brokers because it's run by a nationalist, a pro-nationalist government, and that they do not like. Any time UKIP votes, they vote for interference in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Libya, in Egypt, in Iran, in Russia. They're always voting on the same way that the people running the United States of America and their pathetic puppets in Westminster, they're always voting for this country to go and be involved in other people's quarrels, other people's wars, instead of taking a nationalist position whereby, as you know, we say that Britons should fight for Britain only. UKIP wouldn't have us fighting for Europe, but they'll happily have us fighting all day long, all year long, on behalf of the people who run the United States of America. They're not nationalists. Finally, they, as I said earlier on, they have this fictitious attempt to convince people they're against immigration. UKIP are not against immigration. Their policy is very simple, that they want net immigration of no more than 50,000 a year. And by net immigration, what they say is that that means it's just a population balance. So if one person leaves, one person can come in. So one of your neighbours can no longer stand feeling a foreigner in their own country and being taxed to death and the weather as well. So they go off to Florida or, the United, or um, Australia or somewhere like that. That's a British family have gone, five people. That's great. They can let in five Somalis. That's UKIP's policy. For every one of us who goes out the door, someone else can come in the door. It's imperative they're not white Europeans. They've got to be from the old British Commonwealth. They've got to have these ties with Africa and with Asia. And Mr Farage says he has no problem with Islam. Well, why does Mr Farage say that? I'll tell you why Mr Farage says that. Because if Mr Farage stood up on Islam, while it would please the neocons, it wouldn't please the BBC. And Mr Farage, above all else, is a puppet of the BBC. He's being run, used by the BBC to break the Tory party. So when you kept say net migration of 50,000, they're first of all saying if a million Brits could leave in a year, it'd be fine to have a million Somalis or Pakistanis come in. That's what they say. And on top of that, we'll have 50,000 on top. In 1968, when Enoch Powell voiced on behalf of the British people opposition to mass immigration, saying it's like watching a nation busily involved building up its own funeral pyre, the number he was complaining about was 50,000 a year. So UKIP would be happy, on top of the change, to have an additional 50,000 a year forever and ever and ever. That is not an immigration policy. It's a policy to replace us in our own country. <laughs> and we must point that out, and we're going to be pointing that out, more and more and more in our core areas. And overall, don't worry too much, because they have not got the capability to recruit that many people in working class areas with that message, to stand that many people in our council wards. And when they do, we've seen it in various places. We've seen it in Barking and Dagenham. Even when the Labour Party stands UKIP candidates to split our vote, people aren't that stupid in the right place at the right time. They still vote for us and not for them. And that will carry on. And we will be here in three years' time, in five years' time, in ten years' time. I don't know that UKIP will be. It's based on one man, Nigel Farage. Yes, I'm a key figure in the British National Party. If I wasn't here, the British National Party would continue. It's got a history before me. It'll have a history and a future after me. UKIP is only there because Nigel Farage has it like that. They all hate each other. There is no cohesion in that party at all. And if Farage does something like do a deal with the Labour Party, poof, that party will explode. It's only held together by Farage and nothing else. And even he's not invulnerable to criticism. Everybody knows that the thing is a stinking mess of corruption and nepotism and all sorts of horrors. And that thing could be there one week and simply gone the next. UKIP is not a stable party. It's not held together by a coherent ideology. This party has a coherent ideology. The Labour Party has a fairly coherent ideology. The Liberal Democrats have a fairly coherent ideology. UKIP has nothing except to stand together on that one particular issue. And if we get the referendum, well, where does that leave them then? 
UKIP is not here forever. What it is doing, it's an icebreaker. It's breaking up the Conservative Party. And while there's been one huge Conservative Party for generations monopolising the patriotic vote because people are too stupid to know what the thing really is, that's been in the way of a nationalist breakthrough. And UKIP's historic role is getting rid of the roadblock, this huge chunk of moronic blue ice called the Conservative Party. And UKIP isn't our problem long term. UKIP is a problem for the Conservative Party and the ruling elite because it's going to blast that thing out of our way. So we will overcome UKIP. It will take time. Finally, why things are going to change is the crisis that we know isn't just coming. It's on us right now. It's just a slow motion crisis. And the fact, more than anything else, that it's being used as an excuse to dismantle not just the welfare state, let's face it, there are elements of the welfare state which are a problem. There are too many of our own people who got used to the idea that the world owes them a living. It needs addressing. But what the ruling elite is doing with the bankers' crisis, the banksters' crisis, is to use it as an excuse to dismantle not just the welfare state, but the nation state. It's a deliberate, calculated, cold-blooded operation which comes from two very different strands. On the left you've got people like the Frankfurt School, in particular Jürgen Habermas, Habermas, the revisionist wing of the Frankfurt School, who in the 1960s and even 70s tried to work out, well, why aren't we getting a revolution? And they concluded the 68 revolution. We're not getting a uh, generation, we're not getting a revolution because the working class in countries like Britain, France, Germany, Sweden and so on. The working class are loyal to the nation state. They call it false consciousness. The working class should be loyal to the international working class, to the proletariat, to the glorious revolution. They shouldn't be loyal to the welfare state, sorry, to the nation state. But they are loyal to the nation state. Why are they loyal to the nation state? Because they're loyal to a number of institutions they identify with. They identify with the army, so they want to break the army. And you can see Cameron and the rest of the crook crooks using wars like Afghanistan to break and demoralise and humiliate the army in order in the end to get rid of it and bury it in a European army. And they also see the ordinary people of the country, the people who've paid in, to something like the welfare state. If you pay into our welfare state, to the British welfare state, and it looks after you, it cements a loyalty with, between the people ordinary people, and the British nation-state. And that's the reason why the left, in the greatest act of betrayal ever, are systematically in favour, in fact, of breaking the health service, council houses, these different aspects of our commonwealth. They're committed to breaking that because while those things are there, the working class will be loyal to the nation-state. So from the left, that's why they're doing it. And they're in this hideous, repulsive, obscene alliance with the capitalist right because they want to break the health service and the school system and the prison service and even the military and supplying the military. They want it all broken up so they can make profit out of it. So the left want to break it for ideological reasons for their revolution and the capitalist right want to break it because they're going to make a fortune out of it. And that is why it's not just a crisis. The crisis alone would be bad enough, but on top of that, they're exploiting this crisis for their own ends. They're going to inflict mountains of misery on our people. It's only just beginning. <clears throat> and as that happens, it's going to open, to open up huge gaps everywhere where people are used, for instance, to Meals on Wheels, to just give one example. Council after council after council is obliterating Meals on Wheels. Well, that creates for us a moral obligation to do something about it, but also a huge political, it's an open goal of spectacular proportions. Because to make a meal in a big pot should probably cost you something like 25 pence a throw. It doesn't cost very much with some cheap meat and potatoes and carrots and onions and water and salt and pepper and mixed herbs and that's it. There you are, it's a cookery lesson. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And you can do it for your family or you can do it for five people or ten people or a group of people can do it for their community. And you don't have to feed everybody all the time to make the difference. 
Because even in modern Britain and the way it's going, most people aren't going to die of starvation. They're going to die of despair. They're going to die of feeling that nobody cares. Nobody's willing to do anything. Just hopelessness. And you can deal with the hopelessness with one meal a week. You can deal with it with one meal a month, as a matter of fact. You can deal with it by showing it on BNP TV, that here and there and somewhere else, the British National Party and people in it do this for their neighbours. So that even places where people haven't got this being done for themselves or their neighbours, they think, yeah, I can be part of that. I can help with that. Or I can simply bask doing nothing in the reflected glory of the fact that somebody's doing something. Because it's a symbolic thing, more than anything else, how people are ground down. Nobody starves to death because they don't have any food. As a matter of fact, they starve to death because they give up. Because you can go and get food, you can scrape a dead rabbit off the road if you have to. I've done it with our kids when, we were, when they were young, when we were really skint. We've eaten roadkill. Yeah, that's what you have to do. And if people have a hope... And if they've got a community, if they've got people looking out for them and helping, then they can get through the hard times. What finishes people off is when they give up. It's when people commit suicide. The most common cause of death for young men in Britain. It's not dying in Afghanistan. It's not dying in stupid road accidents. It's suicide because they're one person alone in the world and nothing else. They can't be part of something bigger. And that's the gap. It's that hopelessness, that alienation gap that we can feel that we will feel, not by helping everybody, but just occasionally by helping some people and showing people what we're doing. The state, the more they take the state apart, the more it opens up gaps. When they cut the police service so there's no patrols in a certain estate, it opens up a gap for three or four of our people to go out and form a residence patrol. We've done it in places. The media scream blue murder and it works an absolute treat. And the police react invariably to that by bringing in more police patrols, which means the crime stops. Job done. We can go off and do something else. Every time they cut something in the state, they open a gap which symbolically nationalists can fill. So coming back to the Meals on Wheels idea and the soup kitchen idea that was being discussed earlier on, I can't tell you how much I want to come back to a meeting later on this year and say, you know what we talked about there? Two or three people went away and did it, and now we've learnt this and that, and we've learnt that's, that's how you don't do it, we've learnt this is how you do it, and now we're going to roll this out, and every region is going to have one of these operations, and we're going to film it. Just as one example. There's nothing here which is difficult. One last thing on the question of food. I like food, as I'm sure you can see. It's a very, very powerful thing. Eating together. The Last Supper. It's part of, it's an enormously powerful part of our cultural and religious heritage. That's for a very, very good reason. That eating as part of your community, as part of your tribe, <coughs> predates modern man. It predates being human. To get food together, to prepare food together, to defend your food together, and eat together around a campfire is something which is probably a million years in your all in everyone's genetic sort of way of being and it's completely unfulfilled in modern society for most people if we fulfill that we will be closing a huge gap it's an immensely powerful recruiter now you might say yeah but this could be quite expensive it all adds up yes it is it will all add up it's quite cheap those basic ingredients but it adds up how are we going to raise the money there'll be three leaflets available within a few weeks of this conference. I've been thinking about it, and as we've talked through today, how are we going to turn some of these ideas into practicalities? We're going to produce three basic black and white leaflets, which you can top and tail with a local phone number and a local address. All very simple, run off on the digital duplicators and get out there. The first one will simply say to people, we're going to be coming round with Voice of Freedom. It's our paper, it's got this, this and this in. It's going to cost, well, we'd like a pound donation. We're going to be knocking on your door. We help you buy a copy. Go out and deliver that in three or four streets and then next week go around knocking doors so it's not completely cold. You're not going to frighten them. They already know what you're there for. They'll already have made their minds up, either not interested or yup, I'll buy a copy of that. And use that to build up a paper round because it's going to make you money. Because you go back to them regularly 
And after a bit, you can say, well, I'll take a fiver and I'll deliver the next five issues through the, through the letterbox as they come in. Won't even knock on your door. But then when you knock again, you'll get donations. So that's the first thing. Let's build that up. Let's really use that paper. Second one. There's a couple of places in the country where people have experimented with scrap. And I think it was mentioned earlier on, actually. Again, it's something I've done in the past. It's great fun, as a matter of fact. The idea of getting broken fridges and cannibalising them. Uh, yeah, why not? Have you any idea of the price of copper? It's, for, it's, it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. And... What's wrong with just having as a, automatic, just a standing order, just the way we do things? If, people, if you go to a meeting, just watch out. Is there somewhere along the line, if you had something done in your house, instead of letting the uh, plumber take it away, yeah, leave that, please. And then taking along those four or five bits of copper to the branch meeting. Because you put those together over a year, and you've got several hundred ways of it. I don't know what the price is now. I'm out of touch with the scrap market. Comes someone to... How much is it? Roughly a pound a pound. Roughly a pound a pound. That's, that's good money. That's, that, that's, that's good money. It's good money. We should be doing that. So we should actually put out a leaflet, or at least we'll make it available. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if you've got someone with a van, if you've got someone who's done a bit of scrap and so on, and a lot of people have, then put the leaflet out saying, we're campaigning for the British National Party in this area, and we always need money to stand in elections and to do our own meals and wheels operation for pensioners in this area. If you've got a piece of scrap, instead of lumbering it to the tip yourself, give us a call, we'll come and pick it up. Whether it's a cooker, a fridge, a washing machine, or anything, put that out. We'll craft the leaflet so it serves you well in any case, just in terms of we're here for the local community, we're here to make a difference. And the third one, easier still. It was mentioned earlier that we've got Jennifer doing an experiment with an eBay account. Now, going back to the 1970s, when, in the National Front, we used to have to raise the deposit in those days. Jeff and others will remember. The deposit was £150. You might think, 150 quid? God, that's not much, is it? Really? This was at a time when beer was 10 pence a pint. So, roughly speaking, you've got to multiply it by 30 to get the actual value. So, do the math, someone. What are we talking? 30 times 150. Four and a half thousand pounds. We think 500 quid's a lot of money for a deposit. But according to my highly accurate beer estimator of real prices, what we had to raise in those days was £4,500 in real money terms. And branch after branch after branch did it with things like jumble sales. No one does a jumble sale anymore because everyone sells it on eBay. But every branch should have an eBay officer whose job it is to whine and moan to people, why have you come to a branch meeting without bringing me something I can sell on eBay to raise money for this party? And we'll finally, we'll do you a leaflet, which you put out in your area, saying we're going to be collecting. Just give us anything which we might be able to sell to raise money for, and we'll word it so it sounds like a good cause and so on. And people will queue up to give you stuff. If you don't ask, you won't get it. And the most important person in the branch should not be the organiser, sorry, should not be the fund holder. It should be the fella or the lady or the youngster who spends an hour or so a night just checking stuff and so on and running the eBay operation because it'll bring in hundreds of pounds a year of money which costs you nothing, involves no pain whatsoever, but it allows the fund, rate, the fund holder to have money to juggle with and it allows the organiser to have money to pay for leaflets, to pay for fuel, to go out and get things done. And it's just there waiting to be done. And we need to do it. So, deeply practical things. One last deeply practical thing. Can we mention it a couple of times? I want to bring you back to it to show you where we're trying to go. That we do understand that to come to power in a time of financial crisis, you have to be able to move. You have to be able to have your activists out when everybody is dirt poor skint. So, the experiment with a minibus. And Alwyn and the West Midlands have bought a minibus. What's it cost, Alwyn? £1,600 for a decent... It's going to run and run and run. A decent, sound minibus. People don't want old ones because they're mainly hire vehicles and so on. comes to a certain age, they've got to have something a bit newer. It's what the punters expect. And it's all been written down value in any case off the tax. So, they just get shot at them. So they are really very, very cheap. How I visualise this, 
Oh, one, one other thing. You can tell they work in terms of bringing groups of people together and allowing them to function and allowing people to raise funds around this idea because every crackpot lunatic church in this country has a minibus. That's for the simple reason that those crackpot lunatics are very, very good at raising money and motivating volunteers. That's what they do. That's their living. So if they have minibuses, we should have minibuses. It's why we got into having digital duplicators. I was convinced that we should start buying those and get into them because I saw the Liberal Democrats having them. I didn't need to know any more than that, other than the fact that the people who were the great experts at winning elections when they have crud policies and are absolutely useless, the Liberal Democrats, every single Lib Dem group in the country had a digital duplicator 10 years ago. And when the, all the salesmen needed to do was tell me that, I said, right, we'll start buying them. And those of you who've got them and so on and used them, you know they work. So just as the Liberal Democrats showed us the way with digital duplicators, so the churches show us the way with the potential for minibuses because they are the experts in their field. They do it, so we don't even have to think about it. We just need to copy it. But we've only just started. So how I view it, it's like this, that... As things get worse and worse and worse, and as the price of fuel goes up and up and up, it'll become harder and harder and harder for us to get our activists out. And if we can't get activists out, we cannot survive overall. If we're not bringing in fresh people, there's a churn rate, there's a death rate, there's a demoralisation rate, there's a moving abroad rate. Unless we're constantly replacing people that we lose through natural wastage, we are going to wither on the vine and die. So, it's a problem if... The cost of fuel, more and more, and cost of running a vehicle, means that more and more we can't get out and about. So we need a super activist team in each region. The West Midlands is an experiment. And those of you from the West Mids, it's really important you help Alwyn with this experiment. It's a crucial one to the medium-term future of the party. Because I believe that every region should be looking to move to a position where they've got a group of super activists who, because they're picked up, it doesn't cost a fraction of what it would otherwise cost, and they travel around together, and they've got a sense of comradeship. And ideally, partway through the day, they bought pie and chips by the region, out of funds. So they're getting something back, back, and they're eating together. So it's this part of something that people don't want to leave. They want to be part of. It really is something worth being. It's part of a group to be in. And I would say that by the time you put in fuel and the pie and chips, you probably need £100 an outing to make that work. Sounds a lot. But if you're selling 20 papers, we're actually only 80 quid down. What are we going to do with that? There's another really important person that every branch needs to have, I believe. We need a chugger. A charity mugger. These are the people who stop you in the street. And they don't they make a nuisance of themselves? As they want just a couple of your minutes. And they want to sign you up to £5 a month or £2 a month or whatever, to whatever cause they're on. Those people are paid to do that. That's why they do it. They're not volunteers, they're paid to do it. And they get a commission for doing it. And they do it because it works. Yeah, you turn your nose up, you walk past them. People mutter at them under their breath, but they carry on. It's a numbers game. If they stop enough people, they will get people to sign up to saving the snow leopard or uh, whatever bunch of horrible, ungrateful third world creatures they're whining about this week. They stop enough people, they will get it. When we're out with a team of 10 or 15 people in a new high street, you must know it, and when you've been out with the tabletop stalls, every now and again you get someone to come up who's really enthusiastic, who's really keen, thank God you're here, it's tremendous. And we just say thank you very much, we let them go. We're throwing away an opportunity to make that person's life, honestly, better. Because the reason at present, in all the depths of the depression and all the financial horrors that ordinary people have, you can't, if you turn television on, for the, the, the adverts, you can't help but see an advert where they want £2 a month off you, or £3 a month. What's going on here? The worse things get, the more their adverts are for bloody charities. I'll tell you what's going on. It's because people whose lives are thoroughly miserable can feel far better in themselves if they can think, even though it's bad, even though it's tight, I've still got the self-respect and the dignity to be giving £2 a month to save a spotted leopard or to do something for Oxfam, or whatever. And we, 
because we're English, because we're British, we feel really bad about asking people for money. We've got to get over that because we're not screwing them if we get two pounds for them towards our regional outreach fund, towards the van fund, towards the activism fund. We are not screwing them. We are not robbing them. We are giving them the means whereby they can hold their head higher and feel they're doing something for this country. You're doing them a favour to ask them for two or three pounds a month. You're doing them a favour to take it off them because it makes them feel better about themselves. And it makes them feel there's hope for this country and that they're doing a tiny bit to give hope for this country. You're salving their bloody consciences. They can sit and watch television and drink and being as selfish as they like, self and safe in the knowledge that they're giving two quid a month to the West Midlands Van Fund and thereby helping us bring the truth and the word and the light elsewhere in the West Midlands. And the first time you get one of those, it won't make a blind bit of difference. But supposing you got one every time you go out, and after 20 sessions, that's £40 a month coming in, regular as clockwork. Bang, bang, bang. And every time you go out, you get more and more and more. To me, that's a sustainable model, because some people will drop out, but we're always after more, and there's plenty of people queuing out there to give £2 a month to some good cause, and that is why it's never off the television. This party needs to do things like that. Again, it's not rocket science. I'm not coming up with something which is wacky. I'm pointing out what every single charity out there is doing, and it works for them. It'll work for us if you do it. I can't go knocking on every single door or to every single outreach session. It's up to you and your people. Uh, not everyone needs to do it. If you've got 15 people out campaigning, all they need to know is that when they get someone who's keen, and over comes the branch chugger, whose job it is to get one or two or three of those every single time. We need to do it. There's things Alwyn's working on as well to help close the gap, but once you've got this vehicle, it's available to hire out, to take a group of people to wherever they want to go, the airport or wherever. And I'll tell you one thing that's coming, when they and us fall apart into our respective mutually hostile camps, as is just one bit of trouble away in most towns in Britain, at that point, where are people going to get their minicabs from? Because they're not our minicab drivers, are they? You know who runs those? There will come a time when the concept of a white cab will be a license to print money. I mean, a white cab instead of one of their cabs. It's going to be a license to print money one day, as well as being a matter of intelligence and community relations and all the rest of it, that we should be looking and expecting in X years' time, after it's really started to go bang, to have every single branch of ours connected with a local white cab firm so that families in those areas can send their daughters to whatever after-school event they've got, or they can go shopping, or the lads can go out drunk and come home, knowing that they're not going to be groomed, mugged, or if they have an argument over the fair, find themselves up a side street with 30 of their cabbies with iron bars. These things happen, you know these things happen it produces a huge gap in our market. And this is something which will allow us, if we do it, to take that immensely powerful piece of local community politicking and local real economics. It will come. Nothing is more certain. That opportunity will come. The only question is, will we be ready to fulfill that opportunity? If Alwyn's experiment works, yes, it will. We'll, we will be ready. Will Alwyn's experiment work? If 10 or 12 of you from the West Midlands here help, yes, it damn well will work. There we are. We'll be very, very further forward. So, one final thing on that. I want to see this work from a political point of view. Something crops up. We need a demonstration somewhere. You know how it is. Something somewhere has happened. If we had 10 of these vehicles, each of them with a crew of people, prepared to come out pretty much at the drop of a hat, with that esprit de corps, so one phone call or one quick text can bring 150 people within five hours to a demonstration in Birmingham or down in London or up in Newcastle 
wherever it is. Bang! We can be there. And then on top of that, we add in our local people. That means that we can produce at the drop of a hat a demonstration which is eye-catching and which shows strength and commitment that we can put out on the streets anywhere we want at any time in a few hours, 150, 200 people demonstrating noisily and effectively with all the right banners, all the right PA equipment, because each of these vanners, each of these vans will have with it the activity pack, the demo pack, absolutely there, ready to go. How much? Well, no one else can do that. No one else in this country has ever done that. And what in what I've described can we not do? Is there anything in what I've described that cannot be done? Easily and simply. It's a matter of do we want it? Do we want it enough to have someone taking on the task, which I wouldn't want to do, of being the chugger? But we've got plenty of people who've been in sales and so on. And we all of us want to win for this country. And one person has got to do it in each team, and the rest of the team have to know that their job is to find someone who's so convinced and happy and enthusiastic that they can just go, <whistles> prospect, away you go. Bang, I want to see it. There's nothing difficult, there's nothing new, and there's nothing that you can't help with. To conclude, I mentioned earlier on about Golden Dawn. Say, so without a value judgment as to whether they're really good, really bad, or somewhere in between, as is often the case, that before the crisis hit Greece, Golden Dawn had the, the electoral support of 0.7% of the Greek population. And they've been around for years. 0.7%. And now they are terrifying the elites of that country. And they're making a real difference in the politics of Greece and potentially wider afield. Before the crisis struck, 0.7%. Before the crisis struck in this country, in the last European elections as a similar match, we got, what, 6% of the vote. Nearly 10 times their base level of support. That's the thing. Isn't that amazing? And yet they are now this force out there that, well, the media are screaming about, terrified about. And they were 0.7%. We were nearly 10 times where they were. There was a poll just the other day which uh, one of our people sent me, a poll done about when the next election comes, who should be in the leaders' debates. This was obviously sparked by the uh, promotion of Farage and UKIP, so it's made it an issue. If Nick Clegg was in last time, should Nigel Farage be in this time? And this company that did this research is a very well-known uh, company doing a very good piece of scientific research, to be fair, they asked about other political party political leaders, and they included, they asked people, what about Nick Griffin of the BNP? The result of that was 33% of their representative cross-section of the British public said, yes, I think that Nick Griffin of the BNP should be included in the leadership debates at the next general election. I'll let you into a secret. I don't. <laughs> Frankly, it can be ridiculous for a party of this size, and likewise the Greens, and Socialist Labour and all the rest, it's really ridiculous to include us on the same level as Miliband and Cameron. For all their faults, they still head relatively mass parties. They still have millions of people who would vote for them if they set a <laughs> pussycat on fire on live television. They'd still go out and vote for them. So, of course, they should have... you just got to face it, I'm afraid... They are more deserving of television time during a leadership election debate than I am, on our behalf. But for 33% of the British people, probably 45% of the British people, if you get my meaning, to say that Nick Griffin should be on a leadership election debate, they're not saying that he should be on a leadership election debate so that David Miliband can tear him apart. Sorry, Ed Miliband, well, which one, whichever one it is. No, they're saying that because I want to see what he says. I want to see what his party says. Or more to the point, I know damn well I'm going to agree with him and his party, but I finally want some truth and decency and common sense on British television, so put the British National Party leader in that leadership debate. That's an astounding thing, and I guarantee that if you looked at Greece before the crisis, the number who would have said, I want the leader of Golden Dawn on the leadership debate, it would not have been 33%. Nothing like it. We're in an astounding, astounding position. That's after all the years of demonisation, all the years of trying to write us off, 
Still, 33% of the British public, bang, yep, should have Nick Griffin in the British National Party on the leadership debate in the general election. I tell you, there is no limit to our potential. Despite everything that's been thrown at us, there's no limit to our potential. <coughs> it's going to be hard for the next couple of years. It's going to be very, very difficult to win seats at any level with the Labour Party on and the up, because as you know, most of our voters are ex-Labour voters. And the Labour Party's got that block of postal votes, and we're only just beginning to nibble into doing that ourselves in a couple of areas of the country, really. They've been doing it for 10 years all over. It's going to be very difficult while the Labour Party is out of is in opposition and is the next government that people are turning to in desperation. But once they are, things are going to have changed very drastically to where we were a few years ago when the Labour Party were in power and unpopular. Because next time they're in power and unpopular, there will be no Liberal Democrats in most areas of the country. And they were the ones who stopped us in most areas, because if you hated the Tories and you hated Labour, who did you vote for? Lib Dems. It's the only people reason people voted for them. And they were taking the alternative vote away from us. And they will not exist as a credible political force in white working class areas of Britain after the next general election when the Labour Party will be in power. There's a huge thing opening up for us. And on top of that, we've got a broken Tory party. We talk about broken Britain. Yes, it is. But the Tory party is broken. Cameron is finishing it off. UKIP is finishing it off. They will never, once they've lost the waves of council seats they're going to lose and the waves of parliamentary seats they're going to lose, they will never replace those activists. They'll never replace those people campaigning for them. This is why in Spennymore recently, Pete Malloy was the only man standing, the only person standing against the Labour Party. There is no other alternative. There's no one else at all. And that's going to be more the case in two or three years' time. There's going to be this huge space opened up for us. And most of all, because the disillusionment that I talked about and the anger that I talked about, that we can all feel out there, that's halfway between I don't give a damn about them or I've machine gunned the whole bloody lot, which is roughly where the British people are, millions and millions and millions of them, that's not something that's stupid. It's actually a fairly, yeah, let's face it, you look at the state the political elite have brought this country to, it's a fairly mature judgment that they're all corrupt, they're all scum, they all need putting up against a wall. That's not daft, it's sensible. <laughs> Nor are the British people selfish. They're not selfish, they're not stupid. Again, the Nazi crank types, when they sit and their internet keyboard warrior stuff, oh, the British people aren't worth saving anyway, they're all scum. No, they are not. You look at what the British people have done and are doing right now. The length and breadth of this country to raise money for injured servicemen and injured service women. Everywhere, every pub, every club, every community, there's someone doing a charity, walk, run, sponsored something or other, everywhere to raise money for our soldiers. Not for the wars, but for the soldiers who are used in wars and then thrown away. There's an immense amount of support. You can't drive down a motorway or a street without seeing car after car after car with help for heroes or some similar sticker in the back window. It didn't used to be like that. A few years ago, it wasn't like that. There's this intense groundswell that people want something worthwhile, want something decent, and are prepared to go out and do it. And that's why they're doing these charity runs and these charity things and charity drinkings and whatever it may be. This is the early stages of a people waking up and wanting to be patriotic, wanting to do the right thing and not waiting for them to do it anymore. We'll simply get on and do it. And it's starting not that many years ago, soldiers were regarded as scum. For generations, soldiers and ex-servicemen in this country have been regarded as scum. That was the default position. And something quite remarkable has changed, where the soldiers, the lads and the lasses who put their lives and their limbs on the line get the recognition that they deserve, and people go out there, and when the political elite won't do it, they say, well, sod it, we'll raise the money. We'll raise the money for the wheelchair. We'll raise the money for his th physiotherapy, whatever it is. If they won't do it, we will do it. It's a sign of a people waking up. And that passion and patriotism will, sooner or later, come together with the disillusionment and the anger with what the elite have done. 
and our party will get its opportunity. This party can be ready and this party will be ready. This party will win and I'll tell you that history will be kind to this party. Do you know why? Because we're going to write the history because that's what winners do. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, all of you. Well done.